That damn intersectional theory, to me, as someone who's somewhat versed in statistics, that's just a miracle of ignorant stupidity because all it is is the rediscovery of the interaction term. So if you're trying to model a phenomenon, you can use a linear combination of variables, which just means you add them together and maybe weight them slightly differently. But then you can also multiply them together now and then. That's an interaction term. And so the idea would be, well, if you're, if you're tall and uh, big boned, you're likely to be heavy and possibly tall times big boned equals even heavier. You can add an additional term. And the idea, this is the radical idea of the intersectionalists that while there's more than one form of oppression operating simultaneously and the effect might be multiplicative. It's like, well, Jesus, could you come up with something more obvious than that? And the answer is no. And it's like, why do you get tenure at UCLA in the law, in the faculty of law for developing a theory of intersectionality when it's it's so bloody obvious from a, the basic perspective of primordial statistics that it goes without saying? Like that's, that's supposed to be the intellectual contribution. Well, you know, if you're black, you're oppressed or Hispanic or whatever the hell it is, Irish. But man, if you're a woman, you're also oppressed. And then, well, if you're an Irish woman, I mean, look at how oppressed you are, multiplied by endless demented categories of identity. It's such an intellectual, it's so shallow intellectually. It's such an appalling Marxist sleight of hand that it's, its crookedness and malevolence can hardly be overstated. But I, I think it's important that maybe I'll, I'll, I'll disagree slightly. I, I think that is right. I think it was, you know, they base their their kind of their legitimacy not on the objective value of their ideas, which, which they reject, but on their positionality. So intersectionality, for example, was promoted by a, a Kimberly Crenshaw, a black woman. And so she has authority, not based on the idea, but based on her positionality. And then she gives yeah. it a complex Latinate term, intersectionality, which makes it seem uh, uh, maybe more sophisticated than it is. But I think it's important, the question of roots, and I'd like to maybe push back. As much as I would like to blame the French, it, critical race theory is not based in, in any meaningful sense on the ideas of Foucault, the ideas of the French deconstructionists. I think if you look at queer theory, that's 100% true. The queer theorists themselves, the founding generation in the 80s and 90s said explicitly, Foucault is our lodestar. His his history of sexuality, his idea of sexual transgression is our, our, our founding principle. But the, the critical race theory uh, 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 kind of scholars are a homegrown in the United States phenomenon. And they say it very clearly. They actually lay out their intellectual lineage. They take it from Gramsci, the kind of, mm -hmm. kind of marks on the axis of culture. But really what it is, it's repackaging the ideas of Angela Davis, repackaging the ideas of the Black Panther Party, Black nationalist ideology, and then repackaging um, uh, identity politics based on the Combahee River Statement uh, and, and other kind of Black feminist literature. And so it, it's coming from uh, uh, Marxism, Marxist-Leninism, black, black nationalism. And so this is the ideology that then they made a decision in the late 1980s as the, as the Soviet Union was kind of uh, just poised to collapse, then it collapsed in the early 90s. The critical race there said, hey, you know, we can't be, uh, you know, putting bandoliers across our shoulders and, 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 and wearing the, 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 cool, um, uh, the, the cool hats uh, and, and promoting the Black Panther Party. We have to take those ideas and then package them in euphemisms, package them in intellectual jargon, create the idea of intersectionality, which is just a rehash of Angela Davis's uh, women, race, and class from the, 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 the previous generation. And then we have to seek legitimacy through the academy. They did this very deliberately. They said, we need to get CRT scholars to start taking over institutions, using the politics of, of identity to start vanquishing our opponents within the academy and asserting dominance for political activism. They're very explicit about it. They say, we don't do scholarship. Mm -hmm. We don't do objective research. That is the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the white male toolkit. We do yeah. left-wing activism and we're going to legitimize our ideas through elite institutions, use the kind of manipulative strategies within the institution pioneered by Derrick Bell. And that's how we're gonna gain power. And that's how we can then filter our ideas from those elite institutions down to K through 12 schools to the point where, you know, you have first graders uh, in Cupertino, California, for example, getting the teachers, or third graders rather, dividing the class on the basis of intersectionality into oppressor and oppressed. I mean, mm -hmm. that, they did it, and that's how the, the kind of power maneuvering uh, uh, worked. 
And and and, yeah, and so I would again, say in, in in relationship to your intellectual history, so um, we could put Marx at the bottom in some ways, although not only Marx, and we could have the French deconstructionists emerge out of that, and then the Gramsci tradition emerge out of that too, as somewhat separate streams. And the case you're making is that the CRT stream is more properly identified with the Gramsci sort of theorists, and that seems yes. to me perfectly reasonable. I still think that. What we're facing on the culture war front is a pastiche of postmodernism and Marxism. And yes, so, but w there's certainly no reason for us to, you know, either further that conversation or to disagree. Um, so let's talk about Derek Bell for a minute. Now, do you want to point out some of his signal contributions to this entire mess? Yeah, you know, uh, Derek Bell is a fascinating guy. I did an entire section and a book that I'm writing that's going to come out this summer with Harper Collins on Derek Bell and. You know, he's actually a pretty compelling biographical figure. Um, he was, uh, uh, you know, the first in his family to go to college. He got a degree, a, a law degree. He worked with the um, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He, he ran, I think, something like 300 anti-segregation cases in the Deep South. And, you know, I mean, really compelling guy who, who I think fought the good fight at that time. He went down into Mississippi, organized uh, you know, black families, got their kids uh, uh, across the color barrier, really shut down the segregation uh, policies of the time in the Deep South, you know, and, and really courageous person. But then something in his psychology shifted, and the great black economist Thomas Sowell describes it as, you know, he 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 really uh, abandoned those principles and then fought not for an equal society but for a revenge society. That was Thomas Sowell's words, and then he became famous by by promoting not a vision of racial progress, racial integration, kind of uh, uh, moving past the kind of racism of the past, but he came up with this theory of racial pessimism saying that racism was the permanent and indestructible feature of American life. Um, he, he, he spread these kind of conspiracy theories that the United States might be on the verge of what he called black genocide uh, in the 1990s. Um, and then he became famous from this. And so the incentive structure that fed Derrick Bell's, you know, uh, academic career, really from the 90s uh, uh, to, to his death and in, in the, uh, around 2010, 2012, um, was that he was the kind of doomsayer. Um, he said there could be no progress. It was all an illusion. The 14th Amendment, the Constitution, the Civil Rights Act, you know, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, all of that talks a good game, but it's, it's really a myth to uphold, you know, white supremacy. And even the election of Barack Obama, as he was an elderly man, he said, you know, Barack Obama is the president of a white supremacist country, nothing more. And so right. he, he, you, you see this, this really um, so tragic a generation figure. into kind of a unidimensional paranoia. Yeah, and, 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 and he had a verbal tick towards the end of his life where he would say on interviews, I might be rationally paranoid, but, and then finish his sentence. And, hmm. And so you, you see this this kind of really heroic figure um, uh, uh, it, it just descend into this pessimism, cynicism, fatalism, and then he's rewarded by society and really predominantly white liberal society. Um, and, and, and so he's this tragic figure in my book, um, not an evil man, not even a bad man, but I think a man who succumbed to uh, uh, a kind of, uh, to succumb to this, this temptation of fatalism that I think then characterizes the second generation of scholars that came uh, beneath him. They play cynical political games, they're cynical about the United States, and they cynically use their own identity um, as a substitute um, for their for kind of cr creative and, and, and confident uh, intellectual output. Right, which which they also then decry as as like the markers for that creative, competent output, just as part of the um, part of the white patriarchal power game. Like I've seen these charts recently, laying out the uh, the attributes of a white supremacist society, more or less on the temperamental front, like punctuality, for example. And I read through those traits, and I think this is so interesting because I know that low conscientiousness predicts leftist liberal view. So it's high openness, low conscientiousness. And all the traits that are attributed to white patriarchy are the traits of conscientiousness. It's so amusing. And that conscientiousness, by the way, is the best temperamental predictor of life success. It's so second only to general cognitive ability. And so, but what's also interesting is there are absolutely no racial differences in the distribution of trait conscientiousness. 
And so the claim that conscientious temperamental virtues are somehow white or supremacist or patriarchal is only the claim that conscientious temperamental traits are characteristic of success. It's so interesting to see. So, and, and, and it's deeply condescending to people who, well, who are racial minor. I mean, it's like, well, it's insane. And I think what, 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 what the, the actual, the, the essence of this point and the essence of that chart is that these people who are kind of left liberal elites, let's say, they imagine themselves as the great kind of cosmopolitan figures who have a wide understanding that, that surpasses the backwards, you know, traditional American way of life. These people are deeply parochial. Uh, these yeah. people have never seen and traveled around the world. It's like, if I took uh, uh, that chart and went to Asia, went to Latin America, went to, you know, Lagos, Nigeria, where I've spent a, a significant amount of time and say, hey, look, you know, these are really white traits of showing up on time, doing hard work, yeah. uh, uh, self-efficacy. I mean, I, I would get slapped and rightfully so, because, uh, you know, this is actually racist. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of inadvertently racist. And, and, and it takes traits that are uh, uh, virtues. These are virtues that, that everyone can participate in and reduces them to a kind of race essentialism that I think betrays a total lack of curiosity 